Hey everybody, this is David Walensky back with another interview from the audio archives of NoDon'tDie.com. This time bringing you part two of my conversation with Luke Crane, the head of games at Kickstarter. We spoke on February 18th, 2016. If you'd like to see a full transcript of our conversation, please check for the link below. And uh, also below, you'll see a link to my Patreon, which helps me do this project and uh, enables me to keep working on it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you had said that, like, you know, the in our emails, like, you know, the public narrative around sales and features is is maddening. Uh, but, I mean, that's that's your words. I mean, what do you find so maddening about that fixation? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> public sales. Uh, wait, can you give me a little more context? Like, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think the quote was just you had said the public narrative around sales and features is is maddening, and the slavish devotion to satisfying every desire of every fan is destructive. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, it was like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> kind of be like, hey, remember a month ago you said this really <laughs> specific thing? Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just, I don't know. I guess, like, uh, <laughs> right, th- this this focus on, like, Steam sales or Humble sales and, like, getting, you yeah, know, like, basically kind of bargain hunting for games constantly, like, I, I get it. Um, I mean, from a consumer standpoint, it's a product, and you want that product for the for a low value, I guess. But yeah. um, you know, from the like, it, it just it, it's tough though. It creates a race to the bottom um, for prices. It, it hurt, like hurts the developers who you love and you think you know, ostensibly you want to support. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of a a rebel artist in my my views here, and like I, I just think people should make what like creators should make what they want to make, and they should price it the way they want to price it, and mm-hmm. and that should be it. Like, and if you don't want to pay that, that's fine. But I, I mean, it, it I, mean, I mean, if that means the creator doesn't become a millionaire, I think that's also fine. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I, right, I know that's it's controversial on both sides of it. Like, no, no, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I was just laughing. I mean, I wanted to sort of ask you about. Um, I have you. I'm sure you've heard about some of this Kanye West stuff that's been going on the last couple yeah, of days. Yeah, of course. I, I just I was expecting to get into that a little bit later. I mean, I did want to ask too to rewind a little bit more. Uh, I mean, Kickstarter sort of had their. <laughs> Kanye West moment with Zach Braff, uh, which is a comparison I never thought I would make in my life. Oh, but yeah. a couple of years ago, I mean, I think you were, were you were you were at Kickstarter at that time, right? Or was that before you? Yeah, yeah, I was here. Um. So, so I mean, like I remember a spike of some of this entitlement you were talking about, where like people I think felt Kickstarter somehow belonged to to them, or it belonged to a certain subset, or it was a certain sort of utopia. I mean, uh, I mean, can you talk, talk to me a little bit about like sort of this, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me or if you remember that sort of reaction, but I mean, what do you make of that sort of expectation of like <laughs> brands and platforms to sort of be utopias? Like they're sort of like, you know, the cool band we all knew before, you know, the rest of the world quote unquote ruins it or changes it. I mean, what do you, what do you make of all that? Well, it's, it's super complicated. Um, yeah. You know, on one hand, a uh, platform like Kickstarter really does thrive on trust. Um, you know, on the yeah. um, the users trusting, you know, just like the kind of higher order of operations behind the platform, and that you know things are being done for the right reason, and they're heading in the right direction, and and therefore yeah. I feel good about this, and I'm going to back it. Now, that's, I mean, that's kind of a general thing. Like, obviously, like if Kickstarter's uh, trust was or trust in Kickstarter was destroyed uh, in general. Like uh, no one would would back projects. Um, but it seems like the you know the trust in the platform is pretty high in general because even when we have like little dust ups like the um, wish you were here thing, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't actually uh, you know affect things too much. Um, but you know on the, the other side of things like I mean this is also super complicated. I mean I'm going to be kind of glib about it, but I, I just like I, I understand how how complicated that. Like the, the what's going on behind this is, but like people don't understand how much it costs to make a movie. Um, I, I mean, I was going to say that too. Like with games, like I think people run into this. Like, well, like, like, what do you mean you need more money? Like they sort of they say so sometimes like they see that number and they think that that's like the alpha and omega of cost. Right. 
um, right. Like, like we're living in this like creative golden age right now. Like it just, I look around and I'm so amazed, uh, you know, like, you know, maybe you you want to say that there's you know no one carving statues that are you know marble or painting you know murals on top of chapels or whatever, but uh, like but the amount like the fact that like the entire populace uh, you know is engaged with creative work in some way like either they're making it or they're consuming it um, mm-hmm. it is just incredible um, and but this has uh, um, exigencies right like it means that there are like it, these things are expensive to make and uh you know yeah. co- like there's labor and 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 stuff behind them that that drive up the costs yeah. and and also means that like once they become this kind of like industrial thing or I, I, actually that's not true like on either side of it whether they're like made in an industrial fashion like a studio movie or whether they're made you know in a gar- mm-hmm. in a garage like like just m- making things is never it's cut and dried. Like there's so many variables that like time and cost, they just change and slip. So, um, you know, but that, then we go back to the fact that people are trusting in Kickstarter and the creator and they, they, yeah. they want to, you know, they don't want any surprises or things to be unexpected. So, you know, when, when the creator comes back and says, Oh yeah, I just need another million dollars. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know that that it who, who couldn't though right <laughs> well, you know it's, it's, ups, it's upsetting but and and then yeah and then of course like jesus like the the idea that a successful artist um wouldn't like if someone who's very successful on like the national stage um you know multiple times uh wouldn't be able to just snap his fingers and conjure up uh, the millions of dollars necessary in order to produce his next work of art um like how yeah, horribly offensive that is. Oh my God! And then to say to him, "Well, sir, uh, you know, you're a cad for coming and asking people for this. You should go and ask really horrible agents and moneylenders who work in yeah. Hollywood, uh, who will take a stake of your movie and you know and ask all these crazy things from you. You should go ask them. And how dare you ask people? Like, <laughs> come on. I mean, I think I think I think there was a sense of like. People felt like even and this is the thing that's always interesting. It's never the people who are backing these things. Um, like I think people had felt sort of betrayed or, or misled by sort of I think Zach Braff came in if I'm remembering correctly. Like he used the the um, the backer investments to as sort of like a equal partner matching from other investors to get his film made. Yep. Um, which is just how movies get made. But, I mean, how do you think, like, Kickstarter has changed since it had its <laughs> Zach Braff moment? Is is there anything at all to the notion that, like, these bigger national, perhaps international level creators, do they somehow displace or uh, create fewer opportunities for sort of the scruffier, smaller, you know, garage uh, artists that these platforms are perceived as being intended for? <laughs> no, not at all. But in, in fact, <laughs> thanks for rolling with my many worded questions. No yeah. <laughs> it, it's just, it, it's, we found it's the opposite is, is that because like we have built this quintessentially simple platform, right. And we have opened it up, you know, we, we try to like draw some, you know, some kind of fuzzy boundaries around like, you know, what it's for, or who can use it. Like the fact that we just say creative projects and, yeah. You know, you have to be creating something new or, or whatever. Like, you know, those those are good rules. Um, like, you know, so but what we found like user wise is that, you know, uh, like big creators bring an audience with them. They introduce them to the platform they introduce them to this kind of method of funding. And some of them stick around um, yeah. and then they go on to fund like other cool, small, weird projects um, or they go on to create their own or something like that. Like we've like. Uh, I mean, it's not a hundred percent like people like I could say the vast majority of people who like come to Kickstarter to support like a big creator. Um, mm-hmm. They're just there for that one experience. They want to be a part of that and it's cool. Um, yeah. they don't, you know, they don't even want to be a part of the rest of the experience, but there's a significant percentage um, who do stick around and who do then go back your like weird photography project. But I mean, do you think like, you know, when you have 
people like, you know, like, like Zach Braff or these bigger people or, you know, Patreon, you know, I don't know if you saw, and I'm really not asking you to comment specifically. Um, I don't even know if you consider them a, a competitor, but, you know, Patreon making a play for Kanye West with the video telling him to come <laughs> shack up with their platform. I mean, don't you think that also sort of introduces the notion to potential creators or to audience that like, yeah, okay, you know, sure, everyone can do this, but really you can only succeed if, you know, if you, <laughs> if you know how to market yourself and you know how to be liked. Like, if you're not just someone with a crazy idea, you really, you know, can't make it happen. Wait, wait, say, say that again. You, wait, I, I was... Yeah, so... I mean, I, 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 yeah, no, I mean, it's just... Don't you think, like, you know, sort of courting these bigger stars or, or giving them a lot of attention on these platforms, doesn't that sort of also send the message that, like, yeah, okay, you know, ever, anyone can do this. You can go and crowdfund, but doesn't try to make a play for them sort of send the message that, like, you know, you can only succeed if you know how to market yourself and you're already well liked. Um, I, I mean, I guess, but man, <laughs> but like, first of all, like the idea that you need to be Kanye West or Zach Braff or whatever to be successful, like, right? That's that's ridiculous. That's not true. And then to 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 also to then like stand on this very shaky platform of like only Kanye West and Zach Braff know how to market themselves. That's also just mm-hmm. patently ridiculous that like there's so many people like just regular people who are not those, you know, not superstars who know, who have a community who know how to quote unquote market themselves, who, you know, basically who know how to appeal to that community to get them behind what they're doing. Um, yeah. So on one hand, yeah, you got to have that, like you have to have those skills in order to be successful on Kickstarter or you have to be lucky, right? You've got to be one or the other. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean you need to be famous. It doesn't mean that you right, have to have like a marketing team behind you. Right. People like do this every day. Dude, I ran a Kickstarter project in January and I talked like a wizard for 30 days. Every, <laughs> every update, every <laughs> comment was in wizard voice. Um, yeah. And it drove people crazy, but the people who loved it, loved it. Um, so, you know, it's like, and I, I don't have a team like that behind me. I'm not, I, I'm not Kanye and I don't have marketing and I'm not a millionaire. Like it, it doesn't, but I do have a community, right? I do, I, I do have people that I've been, you know, kind of appealing to with my games for, um, you know, yeah. for years. So, um, but I mean, I, I, on the other side of it, I see people come to Kickstarter every day, at, like with like you, if you don't have an audience or you have a very small audience, you come with a small goal, right? And you build, like expecting to like roll out of the gate and fund your MMO RPG, uh, you know, massive multiplayer server extravaganza, like expecting to to raise the billions of dollars you're going to need for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, as your first project out of the gate with no art and just a, you know, yeah. a video of you saying like, I have a passion for games. I've been playing games since I was twelve. Like, okay, like dial it back. Like, let's start start somewhere, you know, achievable. Like, this is just like basic like creative things. Like ba- basic like, you know, you, like you don't start with the building the most complicated ship in the bottle. You start with a yeah. sailboat. <laughs> Well, I mean, shift gears a little bit. I mean, like, what are what are your thoughts about backers who take, um, you know, Kickstarter goals stated, even like obviously stated well before the projects begin as as gospel? And uh, you know, I guess in this case, I'm not asking you to comment specifically about the double fine uh, thing, but just in general. I mean, uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts about people who take, you know, <laughs> these 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 intentions as as uh, literal promises? Well, I mean, I understand. It's a it's a totally sympathetic, yeah, position. Like it's not, um, you know, you're you're like I said, it goes back to trust. You're trusting in this person who, who is a creator who you played their stuff. You like it. You you know you you want to trust them and um. So, um, so I mean, it's totally understandable. You don't know how things are made. So when they tell you, like, oh, I'm going to make a thing by this date and it's going to be like this, um, it's like that. that's how that then gets burned into your brain. And then to have, yeah. have that change and say, well, actually, it's going to be this date and it's going to be different. So, I mean, when, when – uh, I, mean, I don't even know if these are things you can comment on, but um, 
you know, the double fine case, which I'll state here for the transcript for people who aren't familiar. I mean, I think, you know, it, my memory of it is that people felt swindled on a game coming out in two parts, not on deadline, even though, like, <laughs> that wasn't what was intended in the first place. They just tried to put the money to, to, to use and maybe didn't, you know, uh, project manage effectively. I mean, I remember there being, uh, you know, some waves of harassment, um, towards Double Fine. Um, so, I mean, I'm curious, like, do you, do you help out creators when they run into stuff like that? Do you yourselves deal with harassment from users? Uh, do you have anyone specifically in charge of dealing with stuff like that? Uh, yeah. Um, I have a coworker um, whose name uh, I will <laughs> keep quiet, but she is our moderator. and. Uh, Probably why. <laughs> yeah, she definitely steps into the mix and when people yeah. get shirty. Um, and yeah, we deal with people yelling at us or like tweeting at us or, or whatever about um, some bullshit. Uh, and yeah, yeah and, I, and for creators, um, I'm, every day I'm, I'm helping creators deal with um, uh, problems like yeah. that. So, um, but you know, like just, just, just don't, like I'm not saying ne- never voice your displeasure or don't, don't, like send a, a an angry note to someone, but man, don't harass anyone like ever. Like don't don't do that. Like it's, yeah. Like what did you you paid fifteen dollars for a game and it's like you you're disappointed in it. Great, okay. Like process your disappointment. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you, but again, you're saying like this doesn't happen with like authors who print books on Kickstarter or filmmakers who make movies on Kickstarter. Let's say it's <laughs> rare. It's rare. It's, it's, I, I mean, I wouldn't. It's not as frequent. I would never. I would never speak. Say never. Speak in absolutes, yeah. but yeah. Like, right. It, it's much more. You just did though. <laughs> shh, shh. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Let, let, let's just say it's it's rare. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so I'm sure you know I was going to ask about this, but um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the Shenmue Three. Oh sure. Kickstarter. Is there? I mean. It, is there stuff you're not allowed to talk about with that? I know not a ton of details have come out sort of about like, I mean, I guess just like the general thing is like, can you sort of just walk us through like what happened and like how it came to be? Or can you not even talk about that? The, the, yeah. The, the team called me and said, Hey, we want to launch a Kickstarter project for Shenmue three. And I went, cool. Okay. <laughs> I mean, at that point, did they know it was going to be announced, you know, by Sony on stage yep. at E3? Yep. Yep. They they had talked to Sony and Sony was like, Cool, we'll announce it on you know, at E three. Yeah. Yep. So I mean what do you make about there was a myriad of ways I saw people being upset about that. I mean, did did you see any of the sort of critical reactions? Yeah, do you to really it? like to talk about upset gamers? Um you, <laughs> Um, well, you don't have to comment on it. It's just it's one of the focus. uh, it's one of the focuses of this project. Okay, so well, yeah, so some dudes got upset. I also saw people like I'm we, not upset. Weeping I'm with sure. joy. Right? I saw yeah, I saw that as well. people like like legit freaking out with joy uh, over the project. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I I cannot fathom what people would be upset about with that. Like, they got the the third part of the game that they've been waiting for, for like 12 or 15 years. Like, uh, like Mm -hmm. what, what are you mad about? I think people were upset. I think they felt like, like, like if Sony wanted to really promote it, they should, they should fund it themselves. This is just sort of what I saw floating around on the internet. Right. Cause that's, that's how that works. That's totally a hundred percent how that works. Um, yep. Uh, Sony, I, I don't, there's a, actually just a, a cyborg that sits at the center of Sony and just churns out all of their work. Just one kind of biological mechanical interface that just <laughs> like, sit, like, you know, you, you feed it and it just says, I will make Shenmue two now or, or Shenmue three rather. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like Yu Suzuki is the creator, right? Yeah. He yeah. comes to, you know, he, he talks to his team and he's like, yeah, I, let's do it. Let's let's do this. Like, and what is this Kickstarter thing? Like, you know, um, uh, Iga had just used Kickstarter, and um, right. you know, the Mighty Number no. Nine team, obviously, Inafune-san um, had used Kickstarter, right? So obviously, it's like 
in his circles of friends, they're talking about it. They know it exists. And so he's like, yeah, they think they're big shit. Let's do Shenmue 3 Kickstarter. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, his mm-hmm. his team calls Sony and there's like, hey, Suzuki-san's like, he's into this. And Sony's like, great. Um, but also Sony's saying as a publisher, like, does anybody want to play Shenmue anymore? Like, and the his team goes, um, yes. Right? The team doesn't know. Like, there's not like there's any market research on this or anything. Well, also, too, I mean, among that group of creators, like, I know crowdfunding is not as big in Japan as it is over here. No, no, I mean, there's, right, like... There are some, but it's not as popular as it is over right, here. Right, we, we haven't, we're not live in Japan or anything yet. Right, uh, right. Like, for creators, at least. We're backers, yes, but not creators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's what I meant for creators. Right, and... It's not, I can tell you, it's not some, like, shadow project for Sony. It's not, like, the email address is not, like, you know, cyborg at Sony.com. Um, <laughs> Redacted at Sony. Right. It, yeah. It's not. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it, I mean, all, honestly, like, if you look at their project, like, it it looks like it's a, you know, a small dev team put that project together. It doesn't look like a, you know, a splashy E3 presentation. Uh I mean, and the reality too is like six point three million is is kind of low, you know, for right. a game of that on that uh, ambition of production. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Like if I if, if I came to Sony and said like, okay, I I have got an idea. I am going to get six point three million dollars and sixty four thousand people, and we're going to have mm-hmm. the biggest game ever. Like, what they would laugh like. You know, it's there's no conspiracy behind this. It's um, right. It, it is. It's a you know, it's a big game from back in the day, and it's like it's certainly big enough to attract the attention of a big publisher. But that publisher doesn't know if the game's going to be big or if the fans are still into it. Um, yeah. Right. And Kickstarter is this really incredible way for the creator to say, "All right," which which has happened time and time again. This is what Brian Farger did with Wasteland, with the um, uh, the Hairbrain teams. Jordan Weissman did with Shadowrun. Um, uh, you know, like all these creators who came back and just said, like, okay, well, you know, even with Tim in like the, you know, in the Double Fine Adventure, like, all right, well, publishers are, they don't really want to hear about the games that we want to make anymore. So, what, yeah. do, you, what do you all think? Um, right. And so, Kickstarter is this great way for the fans to be like, yes. <laughs> well, you had said too. Um, I did want to ask you a little bit about uh, board games um, before we wrapped up, which is you had said that. Um, at least a month ago or however, whenever we were arranging this song, you had said that compared to board games, the state of design for digital games is still a few generations behind. And so I'd be curious to hear you just sort of talk about, you know, like how you perceive that as uh, being true. And I sort of was wondering, you know, is that perhaps because there is a fixation on games, uh, on video games on budgets? Is there less of that in board games? Uh, no, I mean, there's a budget for all this stuff, but it's just that... Sure. Like... But you don't you don't need you know six point three million dollars to make a board game necessarily. No, but also just that my I have so many more tools available to me um, as a like a tabletop game creator or even a live game live games creator. Um, yeah. Like it's not like a, you know I'm not limited by Unity, um, which is a great language and very versatile. Um, right. Like Killer Queen was done in Unity. Like who knew? Um, but oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> so learn something every day. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, like, you know, digital games, they're getting better and they're getting more sophisticated, but the, like, the, you know, the rapidity uh, and subtlety with which I can make, you know, a series of very complex moral choices inside of a live game, um, like, a, you know, a LARP or something like that, it's, it's astounding, right? And the efficiency and the economy of the system inside of those games where, you know, to enable me to make these choices and for where the, you know, the outcome is um, unpredictable, right? That where the outcome is not a set thing where it's something, you know, where I'm going to have to kind of process like, okay, I've made all these choices and it's got me this outcome. Yeah. Uh, okay. Wow. Cool. Like, it's, I mean, like at the end of Mass Effect 3, you know, we're, okay, I've made all these moral choices and they've got to funnel down into this one outcome, which is cool, but, uh, but really I, it didn't, you know, it doesn't sit well with anybody because it's not, like, it's not really the sum of all the choices that they've made. Um, right, right. You know, so, I mean, there's there's that side of things. And, and then just, like, the ability to uh, be flexible and experiment and to, 
uh, you know, with all these different types of interfaces and mechanics systems uh, inside of tabletop games, like you can just iterate so fast. Um, I mean, one one of my favorite stories of development in the past few years is um, with XCOM and the fact that they did it all out on paper first, um, right? They made a pen and paper version of that game, you know, before they went uh, into the code, which is super smart and super cool. And then, I mean, it, I, I really want to talk to them about this, but like, it seems like with the second one that they played a lot of board games in the intervening years uh, between, you know, the first you know, their first reboot and, and the sequel now, um, the, like the, like, it's so clear that they're adopting, um, these, you know, ideas from games like Risk Legacy or Pandemic or, uh, like all these great tabletop games that, um, you know, Mm -hmm. are kind of pushing that medium forward. Uh, and, you know, and right. So it's very tough to, to imitate those, um, in the digital space, um, and to give players the range of choices and the kind of the subtlety of experience. I mean, I think we've seen some similar uh, experimentation on, you know, Kickstarter and video games where there has been a rise of, um, I don't know if you can really call it a trend, but there seems to be more of like, you know, sort of prototypes or vertical slices of video games being made on, on Kickstarter. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Are you surprised that that's starting to be a thing we're seeing more of? Oh, like is it m- we're seeing more prototypes and video games being funded for Kickstarter? Just people, yeah, I think, like, going to the mat with it and, and just, you know, well, I, seeing... Yeah. I mean, I certainly think that people are using, I mean, the opportunity of Kickstarter to fund more, like, experimental or out-there games. Um, yeah. But as far as, like, prototypes and vertical slices, no fucking way. The backers for, vi- backers for video games are so demanding. They want a full game, like, right now. Um, like the, but, I mean, you've seen those projects I'm talking about, right? There's a handful. Maybe. Uh, I... I, but I mean, my experience for most games on Kickstarter is that the backers want a full experience. Uh, That's my perception too. So I mean, I found it. I mean, I can send you some links. I don't know if every single game project that passes are, are they are they recent or are they? Uh, yeah, these are recent. I mean, I can send you some links if you want. Uh, I think you know by virtue of my doing this project, people tend to send me links too. So. Sure. Uh, you know, I think there was one that was called Broken. Oh, yeah. The- well, I mean, Broken, though, like, that's really interesting, right? Broken, it, it, like, they, right, they want to create a tech demo for that thing, and no one is into it. <laughs> it's not over yet. <laughs> I mean... But it hasn't hit that, you know, the people are savvy enough now to know, like, how many days into a project, oh. you know, a certain number. It hasn't hit that number yet. You are right. Yeah, but the, anyone who tells you that about the... It, it has to hit a certain number by its... They're wrong. Um, I don't believe that anyway. Yeah, so. <laughs> just because, because of, like you said earlier, it's just like you never know what might happen later. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I mean, you know, I was kind of surprised, too, to see people going for that or trying to make that happen because that was sort of my perception, too. But of, of, of the platform, it's, this is for, you know, it's for finished, you know, one-and-done type projects. I mean, uh, has there been an instance or a couple instances where people's use of the platform in the game space has sort of surprised you or you sort of thought like, oh, this isn't really what it was intended for, but that's pretty cool. Oh, every day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, there, there's just, it's it's hard to keep track of them all, but there's just no one right way to use the platform. And so I, 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 right. I, I love that. And I'm just being constantly surprised um, by, you know, what people are doing or the way they're presenting their projects. Um, and like like visual novels, the fact that these are a thing. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a huge audience for visual novels out there. Um, and now they've come to Kickstarter to fund translations or to fund new ones. Um, mm-hmm. And it, you know, there were maybe a couple, um, uh, you know, when I started, there'd be, you know, one here or there, but now it's just a steady drumbeat of these, uh, these projects. Hmm. Well, uh, so I have just two more quick questions for you. One of them is just from a lot of the devs that I know. I mean, they were sort of curious about sort of the methodology for staff picks in in video games. Sort of like what's the criteria for selection and sort of what's the impact you see that the selection, just you guys highlighting them. Like how do you select them and what does selecting them seem to do for those projects? Well, it's... uh, Or is this like a secret sauce thing you shouldn't talk about? Um, no, I mean, we, um, it, like for, it, we're just looking for a good presentation. 
uh, and a, like a cool idea, like something, you know, something that makes us go like, yeah, uh, like it's really <laughs> that simple for the, for, yeah. like, for that stuff. And, and then like the, the numbers behind it, like either like, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Either we're just, we have a good eye for picking winners, uh, <laughs> or, you know, like, you know, our stamp of approval is instant success. Like, I, I think it's the former, not the latter. Right. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's impossible to say, because we would have to compare, like, uh, um, you know, two projects that are either very, very similar or exactly alike uh, <laughs> that are running at the same time, and one with a staff pick and one without. So would have to ask the cyborg at Kickstarter, perhaps. We would have to ask the, the cyborg at the center of Kickstarter. That's right. <laughs> well, okay, so this will be my, my last question for you. And uh, thanks again for making the time and uh, being receptive to being up to talk from Carol. But um, So this is a intentionally broad, and please feel free to interpret this or go wherever you'd like to with this. Um, what do you think video games have accomplished? What do I think video games have accomplished? Yeah. They have pu- pushed a lot of pixels around, sir. Um, they, they make a lot of people happy, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, making games accessible and, and really, you know, opening up, um, like, you know, they're part of like the, the fabric of this, what what are they, who calls it? This is it, um, Zimmerman or something. Who the fuck calls it? The ludic century. Um, (laughs) right. The, the idea that, that that, (laughs) you know, of this like whole, like, the kind of elevation or the elevation slash acknowledgement of games is not this, not a diversion, not this, you know, not something for children, not this thing, this side thing that we do, but as a cultural pillar, right? That games, you know, we, we've video games has really helped us acknowledge that, you know, games stand alongside art. They stand alongside sport. Uh, you know, they stand alongside, you know, uh, you know, all of these other, like, you know, things that make us human and give us society. Um, and, you know, we've been able to recognize that, yeah, we everybody plays games and we play games all the time and they're vital to the human experience. Um, and so, you know, video games, you know, have, have helped, you know, push that out. Um, uh, you know, it really helped us acknowledge that. Um, and they, you know, they bring a lot of people, a lot of joy, like, and, you know, or maybe some rage quit. 